remain relevant in today's operation tempo. We'll now hear from General Rick Lynch, the Assistant Chief of Staff for Installation Management and Commanding General of Installation Management Command, Major General Reuben Jones, Commanding General Morrell Welfare Recreation Command, Lieutenant General Jack Stoltz, Chief of the Army Reserves and Commanding General of the United States Army Reserve Command, and Major General Raymond Carpenter, Acting Director of the Army National Guard and National Guard Bureau. And without further ado, I'll introduce General Lynch. Hey folks, uh, for those of you that do know me, you know that uh, this is not important to me. The title, General Lynch, is not important to me. All the titles that I have with the three jobs I have are not entitled. The title that's important to me is the title of Sarah's husband and the father of Susan and Lucas. That's the most important thing to me. It always has been. It always has been. It always will be. You know, I had the privilege of commanding the 3rd Infantry Division and Fort Stewart. I had the privilege of commanding the 3rd Corps and Fort Hood. Both on the field of battle and at Fort Hood. I linked up with my battle buddy, Command Sergeant Major Neil Sayatola. Three, day, three months after I took command of the Corps, General Casey came in and said, Hey, Rick, he said, in one year, he said, I'm going to make you the CGM comp. I looked at Chief Staff of the Army. I said, well, my idea would be I would deploy the Corps to combat, and then when I bring the Corps back, then I'm at your service. And he reminded me that he was the Chief Staff of the Army, and I wasn't, and I was going to be the CGM comp. <laughs> I immediately went to my battle buddy who had an adjacent office and said, hey, I'm going to MCOM, come with. He said, sure, both of us have this passion for our families. So I don't, blink the, I don't think the Army is going to break because of our soldiers. You know, I speak with some authority. When I commanded the 3rd Division in combat, in the most difficult time, when we were killer capturing 6,000 bad people and 153 of our soldiers died on the battlefield in the place I put them, even the most difficult time, our soldiers were re-enlisting in droves. We as a division made our re-enlistment objective three months into the fiscal year. I got the 3 Corps and Fort Hood, and the same thing was happening with the 1st Cavalry Division and the 4th Infantry Division. I know that our Army's not at risk because of our soldiers. They know what they're doing is important. They are protecting our freedoms and our way of life. They are ensuring that their kids and their kids' kids enjoy the same freedoms we enjoy today. The Army won't break because of our soldiers, but the Army may break because of wear and tear on our families. Nine years of war, it's difficult. It's unbelievable, and it's un almost unbearable. So when General Casey gave me the opportunity to command MCOM and be the axiom for the Army, it was a blessing because it was the position where you can truly facilitate taking care of our soldiers, our civilians, and their families. General Casey told me on day one, he says, Rick, whatever we do, we're not going to walk away from the Army Family Covenant. You heard him talk about it before. Right now, $1.7 billion dedicated to Army Family Programs, and that will continue over the next five years, non-negotiable. We won't walk away from that. And you got to know that's true, and you got to share with the families you represent when you go back, that we're not going to walk away from the Army Family Covenant. Having said that, there's probably better ways to do it in certain instances, and that's what we're looking for now. If you've got a writing utensil and a piece of paper, I'd ask you to write this down, because this is important. At least it's important to me. I went to West Point because I couldn't afford to go to school anywhere else. Uh, my, my life's ambition is to open a bar in Austin, Texas, but between now and then, and now, now and then, what we're going to do is serve families. Um, many of you are around my generation. Many of you are. Not all of you are. So if you're around my generation and you're sitting next to a youngin, explain this story to him. But I was born in 1955, and my mother allowed my grandmother to determine what my name would be. Her favorite show in 1955 was I Love Lucy. Remember I Love Lucy? <laughs> Who was the lead, what was the name of the male character, the lead male character on I Love Lucy? <laughs> See? Ricky Ricardo. Ricky. R-I-C-K-Y Ricardo. That's how I got stuck with, I'm sorry, that's how I got the name. Ricky, no middle name, Lynch. Ricky, no middle name, Lynch. So when you, 
when you send me, and that's Lucy right there. When you send me an email, and I implore you to do that, it's ricky.lynch at us.army.mil. That's what I hope you write down. Because we only exist in MCOM to serve you, provide you a quality of life that's commensurate with your quality of service. That's why we exist. You know, when General Casey does his surveys, that's interesting to me, and I wrote it all down, and you could tell I was the guy who was looking at when the, who got more nays than yays to work on those things. But really what I found is you got to attack the problem one problem at a time, right? So if you've got a situation, whether it's at Fort Leonard Wood with schools or somewhere with access to health care, you got to send me the note and just say, here's my situation. And what we'll do is we'll work on that situation and at the same time address the problem for the greater army. So please don't hesitate to do that. Now I've declared myself the family first general and the starfish general. Who's heard the story of the kid on the, on the beach with the starfish. I love telling the story, so there's always one person in the room who hadn't heard it, so I'll tell it. <laughs> so you got this youngster on the beach, and it's littered with starfish. And he's picking up starfish and throwing them back in the water. And an old guy like me came up and said, hey, youngin, what are you doing? He said, I'm saving starfish. And the old guy said, well, you can't save them all. Look, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of starfish on the beach. You can't save them all. He bent over, picked up another one, threw it in the water. He said, no, but I can save that one. I can save that one. That's what I try to do on a daily basis. So if you got a situation where we can improve your lot in life, please don't hesitate to contact me. We'll work through the issue. We'll address your problem and then help other people as well. They've given me about uh, you know, 10 minutes to hit the highlights of some programs. And Jack and Ray and Ruben will do the same thing. So let me talk about three of them that I think you need to be aware of. And then I'm looking forward to whatever questions you might have. General Casey says, no way, Lynch, are we going to walk away from Army family programs. Like he said, there is some level of redundancy. We acknowledge that. We're just going to accept that for a while. You know better than I do where the redundancy is on your insulation. You know better than I do where the gap is for family programs on your insulation. Let us know about that. But what we are working on is the improving service delivery. We call it ACS transformation. The focal point on the installation for delivery of family programs is Army Community Services. We're not convinced we got that exactly right. Rarely do you go to a situation where everybody says, yeah, I know everything that's going on, and I'm comfortable with the service I'm getting on this installation. You know, Sarah and I worked hard on family programs at Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, I, declared, I declared Fort Hood to be the family first corps. Sent kids home for dinner by 6, sent them home at 3 o'clock on Thursdays, didn't let them work on weekends without my personal approval. Spent a lot of time on family programs. General and Mrs. Casey came in towards the end of my command tour and said, we'd like to meet with some soldiers and families like they like to do. I never pick them. I say, we need some soldiers and families. They showed up. He looked around the room. He says, what do you think about the family programs on Fort Hood? And a young private's wife stood up and says, there aren't any family programs on Fort Hood. And she was speaking from her perspective. That's what she believed to be true, which shows you there might be a disconnect between generating the programs and telling people about the programs. So what we're trying to do is see how can we transform Army Community Services to make it more user-friendly. Right now, it's a lot of specialists. You know, if you need help with this, when you go there, if that person's there, great. If not, you got to go away and come back later. Why don't we have more generalists and less specialists? Why don't we spend more time pushing ACS out to the units as opposed to requiring people to come to ACS to get a, to get a service met? So we need your help with that. We need your help thinking through what would a transform Army community service look like? That's number one. Number two, I asked three questions. Are we doing the right things? Number one, are we doing things right? Number two, those are two separate questions. And the third question is what are we missing? What are we missing? And you know, we don't know, but you're going to tell me because you're going to send me an email and tell me, here, General, what you, here's what you're missing. What's keeping me awake at night is that potentially there's a gold star family, a survivor, who we've forgotten about, who we've forgotten about. It tears me up. As I told you, 153 so soldiers died on a place in the battlefield. I placed them. I look at their cards every day as I start my day in prayer, and I think about them, and I think about their families. We have lost 4,100 soldiers on the fields of battle. We have 25,000 Gold Star family members out there, and we are committed 
to maintain in contact with them. We are committed to helping them through their time of need. And as you know better than I do, the tragedy may have occurred six years ago, but the, for, for the family member, it's as raw today as it was six years ago. So the Survivor Outreach Services Program is so very important. And on the installation, we're trying to rejuvenate that program, build Gold Star Family Centers, have a structure in place so that we can reach out to the Gold Star families. Please know about that and please help us with that as you can. In fact, Family Forum number four is gonna be dedicated to our Survivor Outreach Services Program. Suicides, it was talked about before. Not just suicides for soldiers, but suicides for our DA civilians and suicides for our family members. The number one source, the number one reason youngsters are killing themselves are failed relationships. It's the number one reason. The number two reason is financial issues. And the number three reason is drug and alcohol abuse. All a function of nine years of continuous combat. So we're working hard to work the programs with family issues. Who likes the uh, Military Family Life Consultant Program, the MFLIC program? <laughs> Everybody likes them. The issue is we need more of them, right? We need more of them. Right now, every MFLIC costs our nation $30,000 per month. $30,000 per MFLIC per month because of the way we're doing the contract. You know, the inflicts come to your installation, they stay 45, 60, 90 days, they leave. I'm now having children tell me as I visit school, saying, hey, we're not gonna talk to that lady because she's leaving in a couple of months. Why would we bear our souls to this lady when we know she's leaving in a couple of months? So we're working to refine the entire inflict program to see what we can do to improve that service, expand that service uh, without any additional cost. And I think it can be done. You can help us with that. We're looking closely at domestic violence. You know, we've had 200,000 200, divorces in our Army since 9-11. We had 27,000 just last month. Uh, Sarah and I and Sergeant Major Saitola and Beth, we did a town hall at Fort Hood when we were there, one of those anonymous calls in, and we focused on alcohol and drug abuse, and many wives called and said, General, we have a problem. Based on all these deployments, my husband is self-medicating. Based on all these deployments, he's drinking himself into a stupor, and when he does that, he's beating me, and he's beating the kids, and he's beating the dog, but he won't go get help because he doesn't want to be labeled as an alcoholic. He doesn't want to get help because he's worried it's going to affect his career. So we're working hard on our alcohol and drug abuse program on installations to allow people the opportunity to go get help without the stigma of being labeled as an alcoholic. So we need your assistance on that. The entire issue of domestic violence is important and we're focused on it. I want to make sure you knew that. And then lastly, I tell people all the time, I'm humbled to be in the presence of the American soldier. Remember what happened. Sometime between 9-11 and now, the majority of our army was watching TV and what they were seeing was bad news because all the media shows is bad news. I was the spokesman for the force in Iraq for a year. I had the senior editor of the New York Times in my office and I said, hey, what's happening here? I said, I take you out and show you good stuff and bad stuff and all you ever print is the bad stuff. He looked me in the eye and said, bad news sells newspapers. Same thing with the television. They're showing if it bleeds, it leads. So these youngsters were watching TV, your spouses were watching TV and they made a conscious decision to join our army while our nation was at war. I tell them I'm humbled to be in their presence. I want to tell you that we love you. We appreciate your service and your sacrifice. Next month is Army Family Appreciation Month. The theme is we honor your faithful commitment, your strength, and your resilience. So just know the only reason that I exist in my current position and my battle buddy and our lovely spouses and my team, both as the AXM, the MCOM commander, and running this uh, core enterprise for the chief. The only reason, we exist, only reason we exist is to serve you. We're looking forward to your questions. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And we will take questions of the panel following um, the last presenter. And now it's my honor to introduce Major General Reuben Jones. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to be here with you. And first of all, let me just thank all the family members who are here. 
making a difference, letting us know if we're getting right, if we're getting the things right that impact you and concern you, because it's important. We have a firm belief within the command that if we take care of our families, our soldiers will do what our nation has asked them to do. So join me in a round of applause for you. I'm going to talk about a program that's uh, very dear to me. And in kicking it off, I want to tell you how I start my day every day. About 5.30, I hit the switch at 4700 King Street. And the first thing I see when I walk in my office is a picture of a soldier. That soldier has no sex, no MOS, no religion. It's a soldier. The common factor is that each of those soldiers have families. And I burn that image into my heart. My command has adopted that image to do what's important for you. When I look at that soldier, I start to count to six. And I said six of those soldiers has an exceptional family member. I am drawn by little Emily, the other image that's behind that soldier. Emily lives across the street. I come home, I walk over. Emily will run at me and run by me. For a year, five years, Emily runs by me. I say, she loves me. Here she comes. About six months ago, I discovered that Emily was severely autistic. And I looked at her soldier father, her nurse mother, and I said, God, we have got to help them. Because I instantly saw the stress that impacted that family. Remember, one, two, three, four, five, six exceptional family member. This program is about 30 years old. It has been marred in bureaucracy. Guess what? It's still marred in bureaucracy. It is still marred in bureaucracy. However, when I talk to families, when the boss talked to families, you know what they tell us? We did a survey in 2009. General Lynch, as he goes around our army, he talks to exceptional family members, and he said, Reuben, come see me. Yes, sir. Reuben, I keep hearing this exceptional family member concern that's out there. I say, sir, we got it right, I think. He said, we're missing something. I say, sir, but 92% of the people who use the program report high satisfaction. 92%. He said, Reuben, focus on question number three. What are we missing? What are we missing when it comes to taking care of soldiers who have raised their hand to fight and win our nation's wars that have an exceptional family member? This program is so, so very important. And it, it has caused us to put it on steroids, if you will. It has caused us to search and tear down all the bureaucracy associated with it. Congress has given us a little help. The boss has given us plenty of money. General Casey told you we spent $24.5 million on the program last year, but we're still missing something. Slide. This is what I'm going to talk to you about very briefly. I'm going to talk to you about this program uh, in an attempt to bring you up to date with some of the struggles that families are going through. One, two, three, four, five, six, exceptional family member. Huh? And I'm going to walk you through some of the things that we have done to correct this program, save some starfish. That's what we're doing almost one by one when it comes to these families, because every case is different. Every family is different. The challenges are different. The needs are different. And this program is about delivering comprehensive coordinated support to families. Slide. 
There's a wreck. Remember, I told you it's been in existence for 30 years. But I want you to focus down at the bottom, those two numbers. 53,000 families. Over 70,000 impacted members. What does that tell you? Do the math. That means somebody has two, maybe three, exceptional family members. When we, we, we know where the problems are, we started on a journey, all components, geographically dispersed, TRADOC, Recruiting Command, OCONUS, Pacific, our whole army. We did focus groups. I'm trying to find out what we're missing was my opening salvo. You've told me that you are happy with the program, but I continue to get emails saying, sir, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense what we're doing. I say, tell me how. So we've, we've worked on it. That's the program. Those are the ones who are impacted. Many of you don't feel it because you're not impacted. Those who help with them, they feel it. Sharon Fields feels it every single day. Those on your installations feel it every single day. Slide. So after we went out and got our focus groups, we said, hey, wh what's wrong? They say, it is so bureaucratic, I can't navigate it. I leave one installation. I got my network set up. I got my state benefits off the installation. The medical care is great, General, but now you're PCS me. Okay, you said you got medical support there. You said that you're going to send my spouse, my soldier's spouse, to a professionally rewarding assignment. That works. But guess what, General? The state says they aren't going to give me the same services that I got in state aid. I said, wow. They told me to go to the back of the line. I said, wow, wow. Wow, wow. So we developed a plan. Uh, and we, we got all the stakeholders together, OSD, TRICARE, uh, your installations. But most importantly, we got family members together. And we said, we need to develop a plan that provides you a little bit of respite, comfort that your army is taking care of your exceptional family member. Tell us where it hurts so we can fix it. So we developed a plan, five general areas. We, we looked at information system. I'm happy to report that the medical command is updating their, their medical protection system, met pros, so that we can go in there and commanders can go in there and say, hey, I know how many of my soldiers have exceptional family uh, issues. Now I can help them. I can get them to the services and the support that they need. Another thing the families told us is, hey, I hear about your program by mouth. I mean, word of ear. That's not, that's not the way to treat a family that's undergoing this kind of stress. There are some policy things. The reserve components say, hey, General, you know, you talk real good about what you're doing. What about uh, letting us even enroll in your program? For a long time, we slid by by telling them, you, you, you can enroll reserve component. No, that wasn't true. You can enroll if you're on active duty. Ah, catch 22. Hmm? So we have to get them enrolled. I say, Why, what's so important about being enrolled? You have more support and services in your community. They say, General, our Army is asking a lot of us, and I want our Army to know about my needs before the phone call comes. I said, I'm going to fight for that. General Stoltz, General Carpenter say, we're going to fight for that. So we're going to fix that policy concern. We talk about training and education. We're happy to report that we had our first class 30 years now. We just had our first class last month to train people how to navigate the system so they can help family members. That's what we've done. The boss, General Casey, said it. Say, Ruben, Dynamite program, 92% satisfaction. 
but nobody knows about it. Nobody knows about it. We'll fix it, sir. So we started a series of strategic communications, themes and messages repeated at, at different frequencies at multiple intervals. We've done that, but guess what? It can't stop there. You will see those same themes and messages repeated. This is a part of it. This is a part of it. System navigation, again. I, I, I moved to a new post. How do I get from A to B? Uh, where do I go? What about housing? What about schools? I go from one school district to another. The rules are different. Help me. Got you some help. We got you some help. Is it perfect? No. Is it growing in capability? Yes. We're getting at it. Slide. Here are a couple of things that we did with system navigation. Of course, we got some money from our, 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 our big data there in the Pentagon DOD. We've hired 44 systems navigators. We've trained half of them. We're going to train the other half in the next couple of months so that they can work with families to show them how to navigate. I want to kiss the easy button. Hmm? Let's, let's just touch that easy button. Let's keep it simple. I talked about the class. We've got the resources there. Give me the next slide, please. Here are some of the initiatives. Again, there are some systematic things. Believe it or not, we're still throwing paper around. My God, paper. Number one complaint, you lost my file. Number two complaint, I got to start over. Huh? Our soldiers and their families deserve better. We're, we're now putting that uh, on a program that already exists, form content management. Some of you may have heard of it. System works, and we're going to put it in there so that soldiers go in, put in the information, and populate the form. I want to turbo tax it. Huh? You want a turbo tax? We're going to get it for you. We went to the boss and said, hey, boss, you, you asked for some big ideas to take to this thing we call a SICE. That's where multiple functional proponents get together and solve our Army's problems. He said, OK, tee it up. We teed it up, and unanimously, everybody said, that's a big idea. Let's help that impacted group, special group of soldiers and families. So we're starting an effort to tear apart the process get rid of more of the bureaucracy. Again, we're going to automate it so that it, it stays in the system. It's case management. You won't lose your work again. Slide. Thank you. So uh, I look forward to your questions. Again, think of Emily or think of Rocky. Rocky is my other neighbor. Rocky's in a wheelchair, but guess what? The good news is Rocky has a pretty good quality of life because his buddies are pushing him up and down the hills of the neighborhood. He's in the street. We think about getting a traffic cop to keep control of Rocky. <laughs> but Rocky has a, 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 a better life because somebody loves him. They don't make him feel different than any other soldier or family member out there. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Jones. Our next panel member will be Lieutenant General Jack Stoltz. Oh, all right. Well, it's great to be here. Um, what I'd ask you to do is kind of look around at uh, all the people seated around you and tell me which one are reserved. Tell me how they look different. Tell me what makes them different. And the point is, they are no different. They're all family members of our soldiers. If you look on the battlefield, I submit to you, it's the same thing. You can't tell one soldier from the other. They're all out there together, fighting together, one team, one fight. And the message I would bring to you is, we've got to treat family support and taking care of our families as one army not as separate components. I have the, uh, the pleasure of commanding, currently today, 
right around 206,000 soldiers. Uh, 206,000 soldiers scattered around the world. Today I've got soldiers, about 30,000 soldiers serving on active duty. I keep 30,000 mobilized in some form of active service and another 15 to 16,000 full-time AGRs. So we make a contribution every day to this Army of about 46,000 full-time men and women in uniform. And that's on an ongoing basis. Since 9-11, we've mobilized 200,000 of our soldiers in support of this war. So it is one Army. And people ask, you know, about this idea of an operational reserve. I said, get, get rid of the reserve term. It's an operational force. You know, the force that I entered when I came in the reserve years ago was a strategic reserve, and it really was the force of last resort. And we were designed that way. We hope we never have to use you, therefore we're never going to train you and equip you and resource you properly by design because we don't want to use you, and if we do, we'll have time to, to get you ready, and we'll have time to get your families ready. Well, that changed. That changed after 9-11, and we are now part of the operational force. We're just on a different time cycle from the active duty. The active cycle trying to get to a three-year, one-year forward, two years back, we're trying to get to a five-year cycle, one-year forward, five, uh, four years back. But we're all part of the total force. So what are we doing, or what are the challenges we have? A lot of you out there already know. We don't live on an installation. We live in the community. We don't have an installation around us that has that support network. We have to create our own. And I think I talked to you last year, uh, my wife Laura that's here, came up with this idea once I got in this job of saying we've got to create a virtual installation. And I said, you know, what is that? Well, we've got to bring the installation to the family because we can't take the family to the installation. And we started down that path. Part of it being, obviously, electronic, internet, all those capabilities. But as we got together and talked to families around the world, family forums as Laura and I visited in Italy and Germany and in American Samoa, Guam and Saipan and Alaska, plus here in the continental United States, one of the messages they brought back to me is we're tired of technology. We're tired of technology. That doesn't solve everything. It's, it can be helpful, but we need face-to-face. -face. You've all been there. You've all made that phone call, and it says, if you want English, press 1. If you want Spanish, press 2. If you're calling about your balance, press 1. If you're calling about, press 2. If you're calling about whatever, press 1. If you're calling, press 2. If you want English, press 1. If you want Spanish, press 2. Wait a minute. I've already been around here. And that's what our family said is we, we need to talk to someone face to face. So we came up with this idea of let's put the installation out there. Let's put the, 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 the support network out there. And we stood up, and I think I reported to you last year, or Laura did, our first what we called Army Strong Community Center. Now that was Laura's term, Army Strong Community Center. Army Strong, Strong Community. That's pretty catchy. But I said, you know, we can't use that because ASCC means too many things. Army Service Component Command, all these other things. So we opened our first ASCC, <laughs> so you can see who rules. <laughs> <laughs> Last year in, in Rochester, New York, and we really said,